freely entered into a covenant of restoration and blessing with Abraham. By faith, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. This covenant promise made with our fathers in faith flows effectually throughout generations. God's New Testament people are now heirs according to the promise. What God started in Genesis is now sealed and secure in Christ Jesus. Chapters and verses in your Bible are a good thing. They're there. They're um, a handy addressing and indexing system to help us find our way around a, well, pretty good sized book. As you take your Bible this morning and come to Genesis chapter 15, which we will be walking through in its entirety, it's important to remember that the events <coughs> and the conversation right in the beginning, especially of chapter 15, is happening right on the heels of the events of chapter 14. Remember in chapter 14, in addition to that, that sort of signature encounter with Melchizedek, Abram has experienced a couple of, well, a couple of things that might have left him a bit rattled. First, he and his 318 trained men of his household have, have traveled more than 150 miles north and east to the country north of Damascus. And there they have successfully engaged and supernaturally defeated the we're not told how large, but, but absolutely larger army of the, of the Ketelamer alliance of the eastern kings. These four eastern kings that were fresh off, having, having fought and routed their way up and over the Fertile Crescent and down the Jordan River Valley as far as the Dead Sea. And, and had soundly defeated the alliance of the five western kings and had run off with a bunch of their people and a bunch of their stuff. Abram has led his, his small group of men and defeated them. We don't know much about the blow by blow of that battle, but just the, the numbers suggest that it was a supernatural, though probably difficult, victory for Abram. Further, we know that Abram is fresh out of a conversation with King Bera of Sodom. Bera, whose name we discovered last week, is some, some hybrid of son of evil and giver of gifts. So I jokingly mashed them together, jokingly, not jokingly, mashed them together last week and characterized Bera as the giver of evil gifts. And he has offered Abram the stuff of Sodom. As, as reward for Abram's having routed the southern, I mean the eastern kings. And Abram said, the problem with taking your stuff is you want to make yourself a stakeholder in God's blessing of me. You want to hijack my testimony and instead of making my story about God's hand of blessing on my life, my story becomes about how generous with me the king of Sodom was and I won't have that story told. I won't take your stuff. But he turned down a lot of stuff. And after these things, chapter 15, verse 1, I'm going to read the entirety of the chapter, but I'll do it in pieces. Roman numeral 1, Abram's honesty. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you've given me no offspring, and a member of my household shall be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, number the stars if you are able to number them. 
And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. We see in there at least four things that I think very much worth pointing out. Letter A, we see a recent trauma. Again, we don't know what Abram's experience was in the battle with Keterleomor and his much stronger on paper alliance of kings. But it's not hard to imagine that that battle would have left Abram a bit shook up. Maybe there were some close calls. Battle in the ancient world was not a sterile, long distance business. It was up close, personal, bloody, messy. I think it is not without significance that the Lord says to him, fear not, I am your shield. You're not alive on your feet, Abram, today because of you and your prowess. You are alive on your feet today because I am your shield. I've been your shield, I will be your shield. Better be a faithful Lord. Your reward will be very great. Now, I think if you had just picked up your Bible and jumped in on chapter 15, that would be a sweet promise. But I think it's made all the sweeter by the fact that Abram just turned down a pile of stuff offered him by the king of Sodom. Abram's just turned down a big reward with toxic strings attached to it. And here the Lord is assuring him, I am faithful. Now look, these passages are not telling you it's a bad idea for you to pursue legitimate enterprise. These passages are not telling you that it's a bad idea for you to take your work, your skill set, your initiative to the marketplace and prosper in the marketplace by your work. The entire word of God affirms that. What this is saying is, don't get so fixated on the earth's toys and treasures that you will sell out your faithfulness to the living God in pursuit of earthly rubble. I will see to it, says the Lord. Your reward will be very great. Better see an honest doubt. I'm so, I'm, I've, I've iterated this and iterated this. I'm so glad that these, these people we encounter in God's word are not cartoon characters, two-dimensional cardboard cutouts. These are living, breathing human people living a history that God has preserved for us. And Abram is puzzled. To paraphrase, God, I'm glad I survived the battle. And I'm, I'm grateful that, that, that I'm experiencing some, some prosperity and evidently you have that in mind for me. Lord, I know that you are faithful. As he confessed in the previous chapter, I have lifted my hand to the Lord most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Lord, I'm yours, you are faithful, and I have no idea what you are up to. You've, you've promised me descendants and offspring. Lord, forget on the clock. I'm way past the clock. At this moment, Abram is 85 years old. And Sarah, not to be indelicate, Sarah is, shall we say, decisively postmenopausal. Lord, I love you. I trust you, I have no idea what you are up to. Ever been there? Come on now, okay. I'm so glad that the, the word of God has preserved for us this moment. And I'm so glad that God's faithfulness to his people does not depend upon God's people's faithfulness. He's a God of grace. And at this moment, Abram's scratching his head going, Lord, I don't, I don't understand. I 
I'm glad his faithfulness is not conditioned on my understanding. His promises to you are true whether you claim them or not. You know that? His promises to you, I, I just want to claim that. I just want to claim that. Like his promise is waiting around like a mousetrap for you to go spring it. I've never understood that terminology. Believe him. If that's what you mean, I'm all for it. But his promises, his unconditional gracious promises are just that. They are unconditional. <laughs> Chase that rabbit some other time. Letter D, a dramatic clarification. Come outside and let me show you what the count of your offspring is going to one day look like. He shows him the starry sky at night. Now this issue of an innumerable multitude that come to be the offspring of Abram is a thread that goes all the way through the book of Genesis and far, far beyond that. I'm going to talk about this, that this week on Beyond the Notes and probably unavoidably talk about it a little bit on Wednesday night in our Hot Topic as well. Here I put in your notes, remember these innumerable offspring include all who are in Christ. And I've given you the verses in Galatians 3 again. I could take you to Romans 4. I could take you to Romans 9, 10, and 11. Galatians 3 makes the argument in a very succinct way, especially in the verses that I've given you there on your outline. Ah, the starry sky. I thought I had seen it before. It was the summer of 2005. I was on a McGregor mission trip to the Guatemalan Highlands, the coastal range of Guatemala over against the Pacific coast. I don't remember how high those mountains were, but they are high. And we were partnered with a little church up in a, a part of the country where the predominant people group are the Mom, a Mayan descendant tribe of indigenous Central American people. And they were housing us in a concrete block, metal roof church building. And it was, well, it was high enough above sea level. It was cold at night, even in the summer. But we were okay. We were on sleeping bags in cots inside the church building, the women down at one end and the men up at another. And as happens sometimes in the middle of the night when you're a middle-aged gentleman, I awoke in the middle of the night. The outhouse was across the field from the church. I awoke in the middle of the night with a need to visit the outhouse. So I got out of my sleeping bag. I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, headed out. As I left the church building, the, the church door was such that it, it would latch and secure itself. So I propped it open partially so that when I was done on the other side of the field in the outhouse, I could come back and return to the warmth of my cot and my sleeping bag. Sometime during the course of my excursion, one of my brothers awakened. To this day, I don't know who. God is gracious. And that brother, whoever he was, must have said to himself, there's a draft in here, and that, well, no wonder somebody didn't close the door. So he got up, pulled the door to, latched it, and returned to his sleeping bag. I returned from across the meadow and found I could no longer gain entry to the church building. It was cold. I had three options. The first was the option of extreme narcissism, where I decide that I am, in fact, the most important person on this team, and so I bang on the door, wake up everybody until I can get back. Well, I wasn't going to do that. I'm not going to disturb an entire mission team just because I'm stuck outside in my shorts and T-shirt on a cold Central American mountaintop in the middle of the night. The third option, of course, the option of supreme humility bordering on martyrdom is I'm just going to wait out here till dawn and they're going to feel so sorry for me. The option that I chose was, I thought, the more reasonable option, being in a church building occupied by a number of middle-aged men. There would be somebody else who would come out that door, and I just had to wait for a little while, and that is, in fact, what happened. While I waited, I went over and I sat down a little ways away from the building. There were no street lights. There was no humidity. It was a brilliantly clear night, and for the first time in my life, 
I actually saw the Milky Way clearly in the night sky, that white smudge that everybody talks about, that I had gone most of all my life to that point and never seen it, saw it clear as a bell. No street lights, no haze, no anything but just, wow. On balance, probably worth it, though it was cold. God said to Abram, if you can count them, that's what I have in mind for your offspring. So, wow, Abram believed him. Abram believed him. And we come to what Charles Swindoll calls one of the most significant verses in the Bible. Roman numeral two, Abram's holiness. Where, where do we see the means whereby Abram was right with God? Right here. <coughs> right here in one sentence. And he believed the Lord. Abram believed the Lord. And, it, and he, that is the Lord, counted it to him. Counted it, reckoned it, imputed it. Imposed it counted it to him as righteousness. That verse, quoted three times in the New Testament, twice by Paul, once by James, as a centerpiece statement in the case for how God declares his people righteous. It's one of the most theologically significant verses in the Bible. Every author you read will tell you that. I love the way Swindoll puts it. This one sentence aside is in fact one of the most significant verses in the Bible. <coughs> in this verse we see, letter A, the source of faith. The source of his faith. God counted it as righteousness when Abram believed. The source of faith is the grace of God. The gift of God. Come with me to Ephesians 2. It's familiar territory for many of us. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Verse 9, not a result of works so that no one may boast. It is the gift of God. By grace, you are saved through faith. It is the gift of God. What is the antecedent of that it? What is the gift of God described in verse eight? It's the combination. It's the whole dynamic. Yes, the offer of salvation by grace is a gift of God. But the faith to receive that offer is also itself a gift of God. None of it is on your effort lest you boast. I'm so glad that salvation is by grace alone because I don't want to spend eternity in heaven listening to people brag about how smart they were to get saved. You don't either. It's a gift. Yes, Abram believed God, but that capacity to believe is because God had initiated the relationship with Abram. And he counted it to him for righteousness. That righteousness is, we're seeing in Abram's journey, it's resulting in a transformed life. Fits and starts, absolutely. Even this very specific promise of innumerable offspring is a promise that Abram's gonna get impatient about and we're gonna see in chapter 16, he takes a catastrophic shortcut. We'll deal with that next week. But he believed God. That leads me, by the way, to the duty of faith. The duty of faith. Though the Lord, the Lord counts to us his righteousness in ways we'll talk about under letter C, when we are the recipients of that gift and we believe. Two things we affirm over and over and over again about the Lord's salvation. Two things that are absolutely critical to understand. First, salvation is always permanent. Don't let anybody tell you anything different. Salvation is always permanent. You may know any number of ex-church folk. I bet I know as many as you do. 
you don't know any ex-Christians because there aren't any. We are held in the hand of God the Father as a gift in the hand of Jesus the Son, held by him for eternal life if we are truly born again. Salvation is always permanent. Second, salvation is always transformative. Salvation changes us. Simply put, the followers of Christ follow Christ. Fits and starts, yep. Stub toes and bloody noses, you better believe it. But a passion and an intentionality to follow Jesus is the mark of a believer. And the absence of that practical evidence of righteousness is a real danger sign. If your claim to salvation is based on some postcard you filled out in the 80s, and there is today in your life no evidence of a life on fire for God, you would be wise to question your salvation. Not because salvation is not permanent, but because perhaps in your life there's been nothing transformative. And that ought to scare you dry mouthed. Salvation that doesn't transform is not real. James puts it like this, James chapter two, beginning in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? There's been no transformation, there is no change. Can that faith save him? Rhetorical question, the rhetorical answer is no. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, that is, a claim to faith apart from transforming evidence of that faith, if it does not have works, it's dead. So what is the fruit of faith? What is this righteousness that comes when we believe God? <clears throat> Let her see on your outline under, under that, number one, imputed righteousness versus infused righteousness. This is a watershed divide among groups that would, would, would hold to what they would call Christianity. Let me explain infused righteousness first. This is a view that's held predominantly by our, by our Catholic neighbors, although this view seeps out into some other denominations and groups, and you, you need to learn to listen for it. The infused righteousness view holds that when you get saved, that, that God's, the righteousness that is available through Christ is then fused into your life such that a, a character transformation begins. And day by day, you start becoming a good person. And you grow toward being morally recreated and character recreated so that eventually you are good enough that you, in your, in your fusion with the righteousness of Christ, have grown to the point that your conduct, morality, and character, you're sufficiently good, you are sufficiently good that God says, wow, you made it, and admits you to heaven. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the kicker. Your lifetime is probably not long enough to accomplish that. So after you leave this earth, we're gonna ship you off to purgatory for a while to keep up the process of purging out that sin and that infused righteousness continuing to grow in you until you can make it into heaven on the basis of your own report card. Hogwash. Pure, unadulterated hogwash. My brother, my sister, if you will ever gain admission to heaven, it won't be on your track record. 
Our righteousness whereby we stand clean before a holy God is not a product of our character, our morality, our righteousness. It is the record of Jesus Christ imputed, imposed, interposed, substituted, dropped in place, in place of your track record. And when one day... Jesus says to you, well done, good and faithful servant. He's talking to you, but he's talking about Jesus, whose record has been substituted for yours in its entirety. You will never strut into heaven as though you deserve to be there, for you never, ever shall. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Now, letter number two under that letter C, practical righteousness. Don't lose this. Salvation is transformative. But it's not your standing before God that's in play. It's the image of Christ in you. As you have come to faith in Christ, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? If you're not following Jesus, you're not a Jesus follower. I worked that out by myself. Well, the word of God teaches it. And so our practical righteousness the, is, is, is not the means to our salvation, it is the fruit of our salvation. We love him because he first loved us. We obey him out of love and gratitude for the gift of salvation he has given us entirely by his grace. This this verse simplifies so much. Abram simply believed God and the righteousness of a holy God was imputed and counted to him doesn't say Abram believed God and so he started getting better and better and better every day in every way and one day he was good enough that God accepted him. Hmm. Finally, Abram's heritage. Abram's heritage. (coughs) Verses seven through 20. And he, God, said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess But he said, oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half and laid each half over against the other. He didn't cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. The Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. They'll be afflicted for 400 years. And I'll bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. That's a summary of the latter part of the book of Genesis and the beginning of the book of Exodus. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a Good old age. Funny thing to say to an 85 year old man. And they shall come back here, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, emblematic of the presence of God, passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your offspring, I give this land. To your offspring, I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. What do we see in those verses? First, we see a formalized promise. This business of of cutting animals half and walking between them was sort of the, the ancient equivalent of let's go to the courthouse and get a notary and let's write this thing up and make it formal. 
The Hebrews spoke of cutting a covenant because of this very sort of ceremony. Here it's interesting because traditionally in that sort of covenantal ceremony, both parties of the covenant would walk between the sacrifice as the sign of their, their joint embrace of the covenant. <coughs> Here, God doesn't ask Abram to pass between the sacrifice. In fact, he waits till Abram is essentially sleep paralyzed because he's saying to Abram, you are a beneficiary of this covenant, but I am the sole ex executor of this covenant. This is not conditional on what you do, Abram. This is pure grace. This is what I am going to do. And so it's a formalized covenant. And then in the, in the next paragraph, it's, it's, a, it's got some definite futurity. It's a future component. In fact, God gives, gives Abram a glimpse <coughs> at the more near future. What's going to happen as his people go out down into Egypt and are held there for centuries, but come out of Egypt as God prospers the Israelites and, and brings his wrath on the Egyptians. And he says, you know what, I'm, I'm going I'm to give the Amorites those centuries to repent or to accumulate further judgment. By the way, you're not dead today, and if you're outside of Christ, that's what's going on with you right now. You are being given space in which you will either repent and come to Jesus or in which you will accumulate greater wrath for yourself. You are on the clock in the same way the Amorites were. <coughs> Pardon my cough. So there's a future promise. But then let her see, I can't wait to show you this. There's a fantastic promise. There's a fantastic promise. We already know that the offspring of Abram grow to be innumerable. So again, I'm gonna say more about that on Beyond the Notes this week. But the land, the land Oh, I'm so glad that national Israel is back in the promised land. Well, they're in a tiny piece of it. I mean a tiny piece of it. Because if you take what God just described to Abram right there, it is vastly larger than modern Israel. In fact, it's vastly larger than the height of historical Israel under the reign of David. That's as big as Israel board, Israel's borders have ever been. And that's not half of what was just promised at the end of Genesis 15. In fact, here's a map. The 3D section lifted out of that map is the geography that God just promised Abram for, for the offspring of the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant. It goes all the way up to the Black Sea, which means it eats half, right out of the middle, half of modern Turkey, all of modern Cyprus, most of modern Syria, all of Lebanon, all of Jordan, the northern third of Saudi Arabia, and a big chunk of Egypt. Because it goes from the Nile to the Euphrates to the Black Sea. Israel's never had that much land. But they're gonna... They're gonna. We'll say more about that this coming Wednesday night, but don't think for a moment that the little postage stamp that now is modern national Israel is the promised land. It's the tip of the promised iceberg for what God has for the heirs of the Abrahamic covenant. So where's that leave us? Today, if you're laboring to be right with God, your labor is in vain. I don't mind that you're doing good stuff. I'd rather you do good stuff than bad stuff. But if you think you're working for God to accept you, you are catastrophically, dangerously wasting your time. God has promised all who will believe, who will trust in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross as a payment for sinners, Abram looked forward to it, we look back on it. But a sacrificial Messiah who comes and pays the price for the sins of mankind, 
dies on the cross to pay for it, rises from the grave to prove it. It is trust in that reality. It is turning from your sin and trusting Jesus Christ by faith. That's what believing in God looks like and God will count it to you for righteousness. And you will instantaneously, in the moment you turn from your sin and believe, become the recipient of the counted righteousness. Your sin record destroyed, the perfect record of Jesus Christ substituted in its place. And out of that will grow in your heart a love for Jesus and a loyalty to Jesus and a gratitude to Jesus and a new nature inclined toward Jesus to live a life focused on honoring Jesus. Would you have that today if you do not? Believe God. Believe God. You don't have to go cut up some animals. You don't have to wait for a vision. Believe God and it'll be counted to you for righteousness.